Friends, it is good to be with all of you tonight. I miss this and doing this with all of you. And this includes those of you who are streaming services because I feel the warmth of our collective community together. It has been an interesting few years, <laughs> and I am proud of what we have done and how we've come together and how we supported one another as our community went through COVID. And I know I am biased when I say this, but I think we did quite well. Of course, I'm your rabbi. I'm supposed to be biased, and I will own that. But I'm really proud of how every one of us came together to give support when we were feeling alone. In determining how we move forward and deal with this changing world, which entailed more than just COVID, our lay leaders and I were combining communal needs with that of what we believe God wants of us as Reformed Jews. Our institution stands for more than just services as worship to God. As the motto on all of your reusable blue bags that you're going to get as you leave tonight states, we are a Jewish community helping to build a better world. And remember to bring those bags back for Yom Kippur with food that we can donate. But why do those bags say a Jewish community helping to build a better world? Because to me, building a better world is one of the many ways that we can be in service to God. I believe that building a better world is what God asks of us as Jews. It's what our temple stands for. But what does Reform Judaism as a whole stand for? I was a fifth-year rabbinical student at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, now many moons ago, and a fourth-year student was delivering a sermon on Reform Judaism that asked the question of whether or not we were too big tent. Did we, as a movement, try to stand for everything and therefore ended up standing for nothing? What is it that are our pillars holding us up? At the, discern, at the sermon discussion that followed, the student was allowed to ask one question of all of us as a way of attempting to guide the conversation. The student challenged everyone to try and define what Reform Judaism is in one concise sentence. The students were in, weren't having a great go of it, and then the professors got involved some of them started out nicely, but then turned into this long thesis statement, and we weren't exactly sure where some of them were going. And the fourth year was looking mighty proud of herself when Rabbi Dr. Eugene Borowitz of Blessed Memory, renowned theologian and author of the book, Reform Judaism, What We Believe, stood up and said, Reform Judaism is whatever I say it is. <laughs> and then he sat down. <laughs> we all stared at each other, and then the room broke out in laughter. A, because that was the best definition we had thus far. And B, he did in fact write the book that helped define what Reform Judaism is and had been part of writing many of the Reform Movement's platforms. Reform Judaism quite literally was whatever he said it was. He then stood up again, and he said, now that I've given you my one sentence, allow me to elaborate. The beauty of Judaism and Reform Judaism in particular is that you're able to define for yourselves what Judaism is. Yes, there are some hard lines, like believing that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But besides that, not a lot will kick you out. And even then, the real question is how does your relationship with God 
impact how you decide what Judaism means to you or what you're supposed to do as a Jew? Or do you just do what's ever easiest? Dr. Borowitz was a theologian and a brilliant one at that. He and I had many long chats about the interplay of theology and practice that our sense of God and what God wants of us should drive our behaviors as Jews. And that the interplay of this, the interplay of Torah study, theological curiosity, and behavior is what drives a healthy Jewish community. But here's the catch. For us as Reformed Jews, there may be more wrestling and curiosity than there are answers. On the first day of our Intro to Theology class, he challenged us to come up with one religious minhag, one religious practice for the entire class. One thing that we would all agree upon to do every single class. And if we did that and maintained that practice, we would all pass the class regardless of whether we handed in the final. There was just one catch. With him, there was always one catch. It had to be something quintessentially recognized as reform. He gave us 15 minutes to come up with a practice and agree to it. And then he sat back and he watched. Each one of us came up with a practice and a theological basis for it. But none of us could come to a consensus. As the 15-minute mark expired, he laughed and said that he had been doing this exercise for 20 years and not one class could ever agree on a minhag or halakha to follow. Welcome to Reform Judaism, he said. <laughs> what is a quintessentially Reform halakha? As Reform Jews, it isn't always clear-cut. Commandedness is a, con a complicated concept. Is it based in tradition or based in ideology or theology? You all know me as being a rabbi who cares tremendously about tikkun olam. And for many Jews, their reform synagogue is the home of their political activism. But I must admit, I have a problem with synagogues that have essentially become lobbying arms of a political party. If a synagogue engages in tikkun olam, it should be steeped in Jewish tradition and values and not political theater or lobbying, or even if they are dealing with political systems. That is how our prophets did it. They provided a view of the world as it ought to be and worked either with or against political systems to change the world into one that followed their theological narrative, which in the prophet's case was God-given. The choices we make in the world should be informed by our Jewish values, not the other way around. At its core, what does Judaism stand for? And what does it want from us? That's what should guide the tikkun olam work we do. Ultimately, I go back to the phrase that Hillel uttered when summarizing Judaism, love your neighbor as yourself, all the rest is commentary, go and learn it. The difficult part of the go and learn it piece is that much of the commentary contradicts itself. Here are a few examples. As you've heard me preach, there's a Jewish obligation to road of shalom, to pursue peace and go to whatever extremes one has in order to get there. But there's also the requirement to defend oneself against aggression, melchemet chova, which would entail a preemptive strike which forgoes a peace process. Which value do you follow? Another value you've heard me preach about is B'Tselem Elohim, that we're all created in the divine image. Being imbued with the divine spark means that we are also entitled to an inalienable rights, which means that individual liberty is incredibly important. That same is true for the value of B'chira Chofshit, that we are free to choose, Judaism affirms each individual's moral freedom to choose what they want to do for themselves. But that's also balanced with our value of kehillah, community. And Judaism is a communal religion 
And as Jews, we have an important obligation towards our community. And we have a responsibility to each individual member, but also to the collective, which may also mean that we must ignore certain individual requests in order to honor the wishes of the collective at large. Here's one example of how that interplay comes into a, a tricky scenario. COVID and our COVID protocols, especially for the high holy days. I'll tell you, those early days of the COVID task force meetings were mainly about giving us medical updates about what was going on. And the advice was to keep doing what you're doing because there was really only that choice. People had to stay away from one another. And as more and more people became vaccinated and masking policies shifted, the world became a whole lot more complicated to figure out. To decide what we would do for the High Holy Days, I wrestled with the four different values, Bekuach Nefesh, preservation of life, B'Tselem Elohim, being in the image of God, Bechira Chofshit, individual freedom to choose, and Kehila, communal desires. In the beginning, it was clear cut. The virus was deadly, and a great many people were at great risk. Many of our congregants, particularly those in nursing homes, died due to the virus. We followed all the state protocols, and we were not as liberal in relaxing them as other institutions because we wanted to preserve every single life we could, the Kuach Nefesh. And we also responded to the needs of the community, Kihila, by setting up phone trees, shopping aids for those that were sick or vulnerable, changing the way we taught and held classes, added in parent and various affinity support groups. As the deadliness of the virus declined and the rate of vaccination increased, other Jewish values came into play, such as B'Tselem Melohim. We saw that the emotional well-being of many of us were hitting a breaking point. We needed to come back together, especially that of our religious school students, many of whom were still virtual at secular school. And we opened up for them, even though many of them still weren't eligible for vaccinations because their mental health was in jeopardy. On the other hand, right now, you can go anywhere without a mask. This sanctuary is probably one of less than a handful of places where we have removed your right to choose, the hirach of sheet, if you wear a mask. And I struggled, boy did I struggle, with what to do. Ultimately, we decided as a community to maintain the mask requirement of the sanctuary because of seating. For the holy days, you don't have the ability to choose where to sit and within what proximity to another. That combined with the desire of many of you to still be masked is why I'm looking out at a masked congregation. But I also understand that there are some of you at home right now watching because you didn't want to come in and mask up, which is fine. There was no right answer as to what to do. Right now, we as a community are equally balanced between the desire to be mask optional and mask required. So for now, we have chosen to let the weight of Bekuach Nefesh help push down the balance of the scales toward being masked. However, once the high holy days are over, we will most likely be changing our policy for masks in the sanctuary. At times over the pandemic, I was jealous of my Christian colleagues when asking what policies they have in place and why the, the answer was simply because the bishop told us so. No, it's not always easy being a Jew. We can't seem to do anything without wrestling with it. However, that wrestling is important. In the updated B'nai Mitzvah prayer book that I wrote, I added in the prayer Elu Divarim, I did this because I see the prayer as being the anthem of our people. The prayer goes, Elu divarim she'en lehem shior, she'dam ochel proteam ba'olam hazeh, ba'keren kayemet lo le'olam haba ve'elu hen. These are the things that are limitless, of which a person enjoys the fruit of in this world, while the principle remains in the world to come. They are honoring parents, engaging in deeds of compassion, arriving early for study, morning and evening, dealing graciously with guests, visiting the sick, providing for the wedding couple, burying the dead, being devoted in prayer and making peace among people. 
And it ends with, V'tamud Torah keneged kulam, which I translate as, but the study of Torah encompasses them all. Keneged kulam doesn't necessarily translate into that. It really translates as the study of Torah excels them all, overrides them all, or is more important than the rest, perhaps implying that you could do all those other ones, or you could just study Torah. I don't interpret it that way. I read it as the study of Torah is more important than all the other deeds because the study of Torah should compel you to do the other stuff. It is the foundation and the basis for everything we do as Jews. The study of Torah should lead to a feeling of commandedness to do all the other acts to make our world a sacred place. This is why I do what I do. This is why I work with RAC New Jersey. This is why I work with other religious organizations like Interfaith Rise or the American Jewish Committee to do tikkun olam. What does our tradition at its core ask us to do? Love our neighbors as ourselves. To me, that is a sacred society. But how do we get there? I pose that question right now because I, I feel as though outside these walls, we are as far from that as possible. Of course, with some room to be surprised. We as a society are more polarized than ever. And not only are we more polarized than ever, we are also using language and behavior that indicates those that disagree with us are enemies, traitors, treasonous, anti-whatever you are. They are evil and disgusting. All I see in the news across the political landscape is just a bunch of scapegoating with no inward gaze. We can't even seem to have conversations about things like common sense gun laws or abortion, universal preschool, affordable health insurance, decent public schools for any child, affordable medications, affordable housing, and locations that enable upward mobility without getting into fights with one another. How do we stop this trend and start building a society that sees all life as sacred? By the way, the things I listed aren't taboo topics. These are initiatives that our tradition has supported and that our tradition has encouraged Jews to advocate for, for generations. Why does your membership to our synagogue supplement the cost of us having a religious school, regardless if you have children in the religious school? Because our tradition tells us that educating our youth is incumbent upon all members of our community. And why did we start uh, the Anche Amoth Community Development Corporation more than two decades ago to give out diapers? Because we believe that it was our responsibility as Jews to help lift people out of poverty. And why have we made over 50,000 lunches that have been donated to Elijah's Promise since the beginning of the pandemic? Because our tradition implores us to feed the hungry. And what about our homeless shelter? Our initiatives through the Religious Action Center of New Jersey? Our being a part of Interfaith Rise that settles refugees? Do I wish that our government did all these things and made the need for us to do these extraneous? Yes, I do but that's irrelevant. We do these things because we are part of a Jewish community and that's what Jews do. And yes, at times I do feel like I'm shouting into the wind. We are stuck in this paralyzing cycle that will just continue as the norm as we watch progress backslide unless we can do something to stop it. The only thing that, seem, that we seem to be able to do jointly is offer thoughts and prayers when something bad happens, but we don't try and solve the problems. Love your neighbor as yourself, all the rest is not commentary. We are stuck focusing on the commentary, and we have forgotten about the love your neighbor part. I come to you today with a plea a plea different than any from the others I've made to you before. What I'm asking you as your rabbi is to sit with the question of what can I do differently to help make the world care for others more? 
Ask yourselves, is the language and behavior that I'm using moving us towards a messianic age? An age where all are cared for, an age where all have what they need, an age that we have been aspiring for Mashiach to bring us but have long waited. What am I doing in my life that makes the Moshiach irrelevant? You know, this may be the first time I have ever mentioned the Messiah, Moshiach, from the pulpit. For those of you wondering, I don't believe in a Messiah. Just getting that out of the way right now. I don't believe a descendant of David will come forward and poof, all will be well. What I do believe is that all the theology surrounding messianism was to give us a goal, to give us something to aspire to, so that if someday Moshiach would happen to come, no one would notice his or her presence because we would have already have made that utopian world, that messianic era, a reality. So here's the true ask. If you were to write a list of what society looks like once a Messiah comes, what would be on that list? Pick your top three and spend the next year working to make it a reality. May we all come back here next Rosh Hashanah and compare lists of all the amazing things we got done. And may the Messiah be sitting in that corner over there complaining, why didn't you leave anything for me to do? Amen and Shana Tovah.